Bible says when Adam fell, he gave this world to Satan. God was then booted off. And you say, well, how would God be booted off? Because God legally binds himself to what he says. And if God gave his present, the gifts of the working of his hands to Adam, he meant it. That means he's not going to control it. He gave it. If I give you a gift, Sherry, and you have it, then I have no longer any control over it. You're to be responsible over whatever that is, right? But Adam turned right over through the lies and the temptations of the enemy and turned this giant responsibility, this beautiful God planet that he made, over to the devil. And you can see with your own eyes the mess he's making of it right now. You know, say, well, why hasn't God intervened? Because he set it up for a gathering system. In other words, Jesus came down, put the devil in his place, punched his lights out, destroyed him, put him in a section and says, the only ability I'm going to allow you to do is you you can tempt my children to see whether or not they'll follow me. That's the only ability Satan has to deceive and to lie. He can't show up in your living room and manifest and start moving your furniture around. (laughs) If you've been messing with the occult, though, he might. You don't open doors you shouldn't. The Bible says, closed doors you should enter and inner doors that God opens. Can you say amen? But we don't want to mess with the supernatural or the paranormal without the blood of Jesus, without the name of God, without the armor. Why? Because this is, again, Satan thinks he's the God of this world. So let's go over the two things that talk about him because of the authority, because we're dealing with when the tempter comes, is number one, that he's the God of this world, little g. That means he thinks he's in charge. So he's running through this planet, lying and doing all those little trips and getting people to sign up to him. Did you know there's a cabal of people? I mean, literally thousands, maybe more than that, that have pledged their self to the devil? Sure there is. And they're the ones that want to make him Lord. We're going to see all this in in the scripture. But he's also the prince of the power of the air. That means he's flying around in the skies. You can't see him because God's got him in another dimension. Say dimension. Well, listen, I am giving you the word, but I am also giving you some scientific facts. When God judged the devil, when Jesus came, died, rose again, paid the price for us, he took Satan and put him in a category that he cannot operate any other way. So he's a deceiver and a liar. And he took all of these creatures that fell with him and put him into a dimension that we don't have access to unless we start dabbling with things we shouldn't. Tarot cards, horoscopes, Ouija boards, These are all designed by Satan to get you to open a door so he can come and harass you even more. Right now, he suggests, he sets you up with certain temptations, but he can't show up. He just sets up, hoping you're going to take the bait. Say, not me. God lives in me. I follow God. And he already destroyed the devil. So keep that thought in mind as we go on. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. Now you and I are children of God, and we're made in God's own image. So naturally, Satan hates us. One of the best ways for an enemy to get to the father of his children is he uses children against him. Satan hates every human being. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or not. Because we are made in God's image after God's likeness. We remind God, excuse excuse me, we remind the devil that there is a God. Remember, he said, I will be like the most high God. I will ascend into the most. I will, I will, I will. And you read it and you see what God says. He says, no, you won't. Boom. Now, 
Another thing I need to bring up when we go through this is the devil is bound. We bound him today on this service. But also, he is a tremendous ebloviating liar. Do you know what an ebloviate? It's what you do to a balloon. <laughs> you ebloviate it. He's an ebloviating liar. And he's a master at twisting things and making things appear, the eyes and the ears and all the sense areas of a human being to appear real. Fear is facts, false facts appearing real. A false evidence appearing real. Sorry. It's been a long time since I used that terminology. All right. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 8. Good to see you. Happy birthday, Brian. Uh, that was I know. We already went through all that and saying happy birthday, so you might, might as well watch this film again. So there you go. We love you. Anyway, so it says, now these things became our examples. Okay, listen. These things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. The scripture that we're looking at is the Israelites, how God gave them an assignment. He says, now you're going to leave Egypt. You're going to meet with me, and it's going to take an 11-day journey for you to go from Egypt to the promised land. We know what happened. 11 days took 40 years because man always messes things up when they try to add their own opinions. Just simple as that. Now, so these things are in the scripture to give us an example. How many know that we can learn from scripture? It's much better than learning from the school of hard knocks. <laughs> I've been through a lot of hard knocks. Amen. And I'm praying in Jesus' name that I've graduated. Let's move right on. Now, farther down in 1 Corinthians 10, look at verse 12 and 13. Follow along with me. It says, therefore... Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. A couple of things Satan loves Christians to do is to become brags, braggarts. Look what God's doing with me. Look, 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 look. look. Because pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So the worst thing you can do is brag on, what, on yourself. If you're going to brag... And when God wants us to, we have another name for it. It's called a witness. <laughs> Brag on God. God's doing this. God's doing this. God did that. God did this. God did that. Hello. I did this for God. <laughs> you doing things for God is good. But you doing them, make sure God's asking you to. Otherwise, it becomes a work that will be resisted by the enemy because there's no God in it. Bring God in everything you do throughout the day. Well, I thought I do. No, don't assume automatic. Okay? Don't assume. If you don't get up and address God, don't think automatically God's just working and interchanging with you. No, you have to invite him on a daily basis to interchange with you. Why? Because we have a damaged will that resists God sometimes when we don't even think we are. Look at your neighbor and say, uh-oh. So the enemy comes. And you'll say, well, why does the enemy come? Because you are a threat to him. So to the littlest, to the largest. Okay, I mean oldest. To the littlest, youngest, to the oldest. To the, to the we less feeling person, to the, the person that feels that they're a blessing, Satan is going to come and he is going to suggest things to you. Hello. And to think that that is not going to happen would be kind of silly. Hello? This kind of, I make this joke. This is a joke, okay? It's like me knowing that one day I'm going to have some Jehovah Witnesses on my door. <laughs> I just love it. I actually pray for it. Lord, bring them. I just love to talk scripture with them because they don't know what in the world they're talking about. And they say they do, but see, you don't understand. How many has ever been to a good sales meeting? When they, when they meet, it's a sales meeting. And here are your scriptures. You're to go into the neighborhood and pound, pound, pound. 
And you know, all you got to do is move them off of those little pounding scriptures that they got the weekend before, and they'll lose it. Hello. Amen. You tell them that a Kirby vacuum cleaner is good, but your rainbow was much better. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Let's go on. You know, you're so, you see what I'm saying? Last time we had a couple of Joe to stop at the house. One was a real big elder. You could see the spooks coming off of him. And I says, hey, you think you got a really positive message for me? He says, yes, I do. What are you going to do when all this junk comes down? He says, I'm going to go to be with Jesus. You believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, we believe in Jesus. I says, yeah, but you didn't believe he died and rose again. So guess what? You have nothing to offer me. How about I offer you something? Take the handle over things. Realize that you're not trying to believe. you got Almighty God inside of you. Talk that way. Don't brag. Just talk. When Moses, who stuttered, went to Pharaoh, he said, look, man, what am I going to say? Send Aaron. He talks better than me. No, Moses, you go. And so when God was relating to Moses, you might like this. this is, I think it's Exodus chapter 3, uh, verse 11. Anyway, it says that God's appealing to Moses about going and talking to Pharaoh and telling Pharaoh, this is it, buddy. God's redeeming us, and you can't do anything about it. All right? And Moses is thinking in his natural mind, he's going to stutter through this thing. So when God related to him, he says, Moses, who has made man, man's mouth? Who made, now listen carefully, who made the blind, the deaf, and the lame? Is it an I, the Lord? And I went, Lord, you didn't make blind people. You didn't make deaf people. You didn't make lame people. What is that? And he said, the word maketh. So I went and brought out my Strong's Concordance, and I looked up the word in the Hebrew maketh, and it means changeth. So listen to this. Moses, who changes man's mouth, his mind? Who changes the deaf and the duff, the, the dumb? Isn't it I, the Lord? Isn't he the healer? You see, so when you look at Scripture, you always take Scripture and line it up by the life of Christ. He is the center focal of all Scripture, Old Testament and New. Say amen. And if it doesn't line up with, the, with Christ then you need to find a better understanding of the scripture because God does not contradict himself. Say amen. All right, what do I do when the tempter comes? So there, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No, now listen, no temptation, testing, or trial has overtaken you except such is common to man. Underline that. God tempt, excuse me, Satan tempts you in commonalities, okay? He doesn't tempt you with something you've never experienced before. <laughs> you've been involved in a certain thing, he'll tempt you with that. You see, it's common to man, his temptations, and here's why. Because man has flesh. And when Adam and Eve fell, what happened? Satan entered man, did he not? And entered his flesh, did he not? Did he not separate man? So therefore we have in our flesh that causes us to age, causes us to break down, a nature of Satan. That's why God cannot receive flesh and blood. He has to change us. Aren't you glad? Everyone take a good look at yourself and say, it's going to change. <laughs> Well, thank you for that amen. All right, so look. And it says, look it, and God, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but will, with the temptation, give you the way to escape. Now, you say the word allow is very deceiving if you, because in modern terms, it means to let. Okay, all right? And it says, God, who will allow with the temptation... Now, let's answer that. Why would God allow temptation to come? Don't answer. Don't shout it out. I don't, I'm not looking for it. Why would temptation be allowed to come to us? 
because the first setting up. Satan is the what of this world? He's the what of the air? And his job is to tempt. God never removed that from him because God wants us to be loyal to him. The brag, God can brag, we cannot. Brag is, have you considered my servant Peggy? Have you considered my servant Sherry and Mikey and all of us? There are none like him in all the world, God says. Read the book of Job, the first parts of it, when Job was doing so bad and the enemy was pounding on him, we get this idea that God allowed the devil to work on Job. Here's the answer. Everyone say, I want the answer. God will allow whatever you allow. Whatever you allow and don't know any better, God has to allow because you have a human will. Hello? So Satan lies to the will. He tells you this, he tells you that, hoping that you'll be weak-willed and give in. That's not all the answer. In the beginning, God said that the enemy could do his thing. But the only way for a Christian to have problems with the enemy harassing us, now listen carefully, is we have to be in the flesh over a period of time. What do you mean by the flesh? Well, you know, you're a crab. You argue. It's all about you, and you're everywhere you go, and you're just all riled up all the time. That's being in the flesh. I'm trying to give an example. Okay? So if you're like that after a period of time, the tempter hears about it, sees it, smells you, looks at you, and it says, <laughs> we got one here. And that's how the enemy works. Your countenance drops. You move out of the spirit and right into the flesh. And we start acting out that way. And there is whose nature in our flesh? The enemy. And guess what? It becomes a tractor beam. Why is it the mosquito always lands on you? You got a tractor beam. So how do we get rid of that tractor beam? What do we do? The Bible says to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh, doesn't it? So let's get in this. Are you ready to learn? Yes, amen. Okay, so the rest of that goes. Who will not allow you to be tempted above which you are able, but with the temptation will give you the way of escape. Who is the way and the truth and the life? Amen. So here's a couple of points. Number one, we know it's better to learn from others' experiences rather than to hit the school of hard knocks. Can you say amen? And you will, every time when you operate in the flesh, any period of time, you will run into walls and frustration. So we're not to walk in the flesh. Can you say amen? Two, never forget there are two of you, the old man and the new man. The new man has Christ in it, so we are to walk with Jesus from our heart out, then we will not fulfill the lusts of our flesh. Galatians 5, verse 16. Three, stay away from displaying pride. What was Satan's biggest problem? Pride. And where did he get that pride? Because he was special. How many know we're not special other than the eyes of God? So don't run around with, I'm better than you. <laughs> I am better than you are. Amen? Because the devil just loves that. He just plays with that, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Stay away from the displaying of pride. Pride comes before destruction and an and, and uppity spirit before a fall. The devil loves, loves pride. It's easy for him to work his deception and his lurements to a fleshly, self-centered person. Christians can be that way. Everyone say, God forbid. And fourthly, temptation appeals only to the lustful flesh, never to your spirit. Your spirit has God in it. Can you say amen? Say, my spirit has God in it. Let me, can God be tempted? Oh, ho, 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 ho. The God in you. He doesn't pay any attention to the devil. He doesn't even listen. 
But how often do we listen to the God in us taking the lead? Most of the time, we're still leading our life. And that's how the tempter comes. He sees you and not covered in the blood. He sees you and hears you. He sees you negatively complaining about this. Oh, it's too hot. What do you want, Bunky? Too cold, too hot, up, down, eep, deep, dab, deep, 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 deep. And I'm, I know I'm picking on all of us, 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 because that's what the flesh does. It always has to complain. It always has to this. It always has to be in the tension. Always have to interrupt a conversation. Always has to butt in. Always has to meddle with somebody else's affair. Say, not me. And my fifth point is, with the tempter, his tactics operate only to the flesh. The flesh is the one that gets tempted, not our spirit, because God lives in our spirit. Why would God allow us to be tempted? Again, let me say, because we are in the flesh. And the flesh is always open to its buddy, the enemy. That's why we take our body, Romans chapter 1 through 3, and it says, you present your body a what? A living sacrifice. In other words, every day, you go right before God and say, Lord, I take off my old man and I lay at your altar. Here's a vision God, God always uses pictures for me. He says, it's like you taking your phone. And you've ever had one of those chargers where you don't have to plug it in, you just lay it on? You take your flesh and you lay it down on the slab of the altar. You get a better idea what it is. And God permeates it, kills it shuts down all the flesh oozing out of it, and then you pick it up, put it back on, and it serves you. But if you don't do that first thing with God every day, your day will be longer, it'll be harder, and there might be a few temptations that come your way you might not want. So the cure for having the temptations come your way too often is be in the spirit and stop trying to live for Jesus physically. You can't. If that was so, then we'd be able to keep the Ten Commandments. And none of us can. Well, pastor, how does this relate to me? Because you have to take this word and do it. That's how it relates to you. And if you don't, listen to this. This is what my pastor told us a long time ago. I'm going to dump the word in you. I'm going to give you the word. Satan knows I'm going to give you nothing but the word. So he believes you're going to believe it. So he's going to come try to take the word away from you. Now, if you didn't pay it any mind, and you just nodded your head and agreed with it, but you didn't plan on doing anything about it, he's going to hit you with something that's really going to devastate you because he believes that you believe it. Now, isn't he a fool? So he'll attack you like you believe it. And if you do believe it, it won't be no problem for you. But if you don't, and you're just a confessor of the word and not a doer of the word, you're going to be slapped all around. And we don't want that to happen to a believer. Can you say amen? So let's really get into this. So let's use the Israelites for an example and stay out of the flesh. Someone say amen. All right, so let's look at the tempter. Let's look at the temptation. Go with me to the very beginning, please. And that is over in... Uh, Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at the first tempter, the temptation. And while you're there, I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 2, 16 and 17. You could follow there or just listen. You go to Genesis 3, and I'll be also, I'm going to go there too with you, but I'll be in 1 John 2, 16 and 17 to set you up. Now listen, do not love the world. He's not saying earth. This is a difference. The world has a system under Satan. It's corrupt. And his system is getting involved right now at his time, involved in every government, every tribe, every institution, including your schools, working into the church, working his lies in there, so the church becomes powerless and feckless, which means powerless and unable to even live a victorious life. 
How is the world going to know there is a God if they can't see the God working in our life? So what does he do? He hands you a pandemic, says put on a face diaper and hide in the house. And we're all going, oh, what are you, you know, now you're beginning to sense there's something wrong with all that. Something desperately wrong with it all. That's why it says in the last days there's going to come a strong delusion. It's going to seem like it's the truth. It's just a tempter, and it's just his time. He has but a short time. So at the end of the days, before the church goes, Satan will really become very, very manifested. My goodness, just take a look around you. Right is wrong and wrong is right. People who are gay and weird and whacked are teaching our children in Sunday school and public school. Where's the church? Showing up at these PTA meetings. What if they throw me out? Good. You'll get more publicity. It's time we stand up for things, but we do it in God's way and not just being antagonistic. Here, let me just tell you something. People don't want Christians to be antagonistic. You don't need to be. You just need to be authoritative and in Christ. Say amen. We don't need to antagonize the devil. He's already afraid of you. He's hoping you don't realize who you are. So let's pass, go past that. All right, so let me read it. Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. All created things. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, notice the three things. These are the three things Satan uses against every human being. He says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Everyone say that, pride of life. In other words, you're special. You're it. Okay, so let's look at this. And is all of these things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, part of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. But he who does the will of God abides forever. You, really, you guys look like a forever kind of being. <laughs> You look content. You look like you have God and a relationship with God in you. Amen. Now, spread the good news. Talk like you know something. <laughs> when you're talking about God, don't certainly, I, I think God is. <laughs> Listen, you spend enough time with him, you'll know who God is. You know how he thinks. You'll know how he moves. Let me encourage you to be a meter with God, to get with God a good time every day, to saturate and to get used because you have been saturated by the world. You have been programmed by the lie. Now let's get you in and soak God and know his nature and his life and let him be your father and protector. Amen. All right, go with me to Genesis. You there? Let's look at verse 1 through 7. Now, have you ever noticed, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but I like to study. One of the things I noticed that in my coming up to becoming a Christian, I noticed that a lot of nations have the serpent and the dragon as their themes. Have you ever noticed that? Hello? All of the Incas, Aztecs, and Mayans were into blood sacrifice, human sacrifice, and every one of their buildings have a serpent on it. Hello? Egypt, serpents. Now we go over in the Middle East where the other Nephilim came down, and you got dragons. Who's the dragon in the Bible? Who's the serpent in the Bible? Satan is. Shows you what spirit they came under when that country was born. Moving right along. Genesis 3. How are we doing up there all? Everything cool? Okay. Verse 1. Now the serpent. Who? 
Folks, let me tell you something. Maybe you knew, maybe not. I used to believe in Bible college that Satan jumped on a serpent and the serpent carried him into the garden. No, Satan is a serpent. And from what we have gathered, what do you mean by that, Pastor Kerry? Let's see, I have a lot of secret informants of government and different things to let me know stuff that goes beyond all that but is all biblically based. And he stood about seven to eight foot tall, and he was a plumed serpent. It was a gorgeous-looking fallen angel. And people look at him, emulating him and all that. But when, God, when we see what God does to him, I'm going to tell you where he's been hiding now all this time. Okay, so let's just have fun. Shall we? You guys ready to learn stuff? I mean, come on, let's, let's not be religious. All right, so... I love this. Now the serpent was more cunning of any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, As God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, Lest you die. Well, God said, don't eat of it. He didn't say anything about touching it. But I think Adam probably told his wife not to hang around it. <laughs> now, let me ask you this. How good of a, a studier are you? Now, let me ask you. Is God perfect? He is. So everything he does, everything he makes is. So the things that are not perfect that we read about in Scripture, Satan's hands involved. So let's look at this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I've searched and searched, and maybe you can find it. The closest thing I've come to was in Genesis 2, where it says God put all the trees and all that in the garden. Put all that stuff there, right? But when God put it there, it was what? Perfect. Where did this corrupted tree come from? And who's hanging around the corrupted tree? No wonder, Brian, God says, don't eat it. Don't touch it. Here's what I believe. This is, I can't find enough in Scripture, but I believe God will show me that Satan messed with the tree, and he changed its DNA and gave it a poison that would change the DNA in man's flesh if they ate it. So God said, don't eat it. That sounds like our father, right? It'd be like your mother saying, Now, Jimmy, don't go out there on the freeway and play baseball. So Jimmy does. And Jimmy says, God, why did you lay all this damn to me? Now you got it. Let's move right on past this. So here's what the serpent did. And he says, of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good in the midst of the garden, God says, you shall not eat of it from the moment you eat it you shall die, or in dying, spiritually, you will die physically. 900 years later, after you died first spiritually, then you will die physically. And then man started being shorter and shorter in their year's length because of the corruption of sin in man's flesh. All right, let's go on. All right, and then the devil, I just, I just love this. Okay, and then it says, you will not surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Let me render this better. Your brain will be open to hear Satan's suggestions as well. Your eyes will see negative, good and evil. Not God's good, man's good and evil. Take a look at a, one of those bridges that man had made back in the 40s and 50s. What a tremendous feat. Good of man, you see, but doesn't save us. The Empire State Building. How about the Twin Towers that came down so crashingly? You see, man's building without God. We need to build with God. Say amen. All right, so I don't want to pull you away. Now, listen. He says, you will surely not die. He's lying, all right? So when the woman saw that, the, now here's the three temptations. Lust of the flesh, remember? Lust of the eyes, remember? And the pride of life, Right? So let's see them right here. They're right here. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Lust of the flesh. 
and it was pleasant to the eyes. Lust of the eyes. And then it was going to make her wise. Pride of life. Listen, you want to go to school and you want to learn, maybe a trade, go with Jesus. Don't go thinking you're going to be the best. You go and think you're going to be the most faithful to learn. All right, let's move past that. A couple of points I'm going to give you. All right, the eyes of them were open. They saw, and, and she, she gave, Brian, you're going to love this, Brian, because your birthday, and I'm going to mention your name several times, so that's what, you, what happens. No. I mean, here it was Adam. God told Adam, you see the serpent? Boot him out of here. But Adam was so busy filling his eyes with God's beautiful woman that he provided for him. He was standing behind his wife. And if you listen to what God in the rebuke that God gave, he says, because you listen to the voice of your wife. Now, I listen to my wife all the time when she talks Jesus. But when she talks anything else, which is very rare, I just laugh. Amen. And I'm not as good as she is, so when I talk Jesus, she loves it. But when I just go off a little bit, which periodically, all you sanctified people, you know, you see the difference. So get to know who you are. What party you is operating. Is it flesh? Is it spirit? And then go to God about it and let God bring you out of yourself. You are a caterpillar in the cocoon of your flesh and God's trying to crack that old cocoon out, kick yourself out of yourself and begin to soar with Jesus. Can you say amen? All right, so... See the three appeals. Satan appeals to her. She saw there was good for food. She saw it was pleasant to the eyes. She saw the tree could make one wise. Not. All right, so let's go to the temptation of Jesus. Go with me to Luke chapter 4. Remember, Satan reaches the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So if we're in the flesh, he will appeal. And if we're in the spirit, he will leave us alone. The key is, when I was taught in Bible college, that we can only walk in the spirit small times during the day, and then the rest of the time we're just kind of with ourselves, with God helping us through our, our troubled times. You know, that's, that is not the truth. The truth is, if we go to God and we meet with him, we start our day off in the spirit. Hello. And depending how big of a charge you get, I'm trying to be scientifically, the longer your day will last in the presence of God. So why just get a little dribble of a charge like you've been doing? Why not go in and get a full dose? It doesn't take very long because you've got the supercharger. See, I've got the supercharger. His name is Jesus, and he lives inside of me. All right, so the temptations of Christ real quickly. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus being filled with the Spirit. Remember, he was baptized of John. He was filled with the Spirit. Then he entered into the, the synagogue where it was his passion, and he got up to read the prophet Isaiah and declared that this day that scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Then they wanted to throw him off the cliff. And he just passed right through the midst of them. Listen, you will pass through the midst of the crowds of Satan yackers and walk on with God every time you're in the spirit. Remember what I told you about what God showed me about? Remember he told the disciples, you get in the boat and go where? To the other side. Folks, you're going to the other side. And Satan can't stop you. If you were to die today, you're going to be at the other side. So stop thinking your life is so stressed. Come on now. You're thinking of yourself. 
You're not, life's not stressed. Your flesh is. But that's not you. Moving right along. So we find out that Jesus, being filled with the Spirit, returned to the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil, and in these days he ate nothing, and afterward, when he was, when it had ended, he was hungry. Now listen. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, first of all, Jesus made him, so he knew, if you are the Son of God, so he's appealing to his flesh. Jesus had flesh too, but it was not corrupted. He says, if you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. What did Jesus answer? Man should not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then Satan takes him up into the pinnacle of the temple and shows him all these kingdoms. Not the pinnacle, but up, up into a mountaintop. And shows him all the kingdoms. And if you read the account, Satan says, all of these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Because they were delivered unto me from Adam. Adam gave all those kingdoms away. So Satan was in charge. And he had the bill. See, everybody said, oh, Satan was just lying about that temptation. No, he wasn't. He had the control of the world. He still thinks he does. And people are letting him. That's the dumb thing about it. Letting him run all over them. Okay? Now, catch this. So, Satan begins to work, and he begins to tempt, and he begins to destroy human beings' lives. Let's catch this again. Okay? And he says, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And what did Jesus say? Thou shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. And then finally, he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple. and says, cast yourself down, hot shot. I put the hot shot in there. For the angels will bear thee up in thy hands unless you dash your foot against a stone. Okay, so there's the three temptations. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Do you see it? Lust of the flesh, command these stones be made bread. Lust of the eyes, all these kingdoms I will give you. Hey, there's a new job opportunity opening to you. You better pray about it. Make sure it's of God, you know? And so the lust of the eyes, he says, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. That's his answer. And then the pride of life. Look at how Satan used this pride of life. He says, Jesus commits suicide. The angels bear you up. How many know a picture is worth more money when the person dies who painted it? Satan's just peeling worldly. And the last temptation was... Pride of life. Cast yourself down. Do you see Satan? I'm going to tell you this. Doesn't have anything new. He doesn't use anything. No new temptations. Just puts a different label on it. And makes it personal. His temptations are personalized. <laughs> Hello. But when you walk with God, as long as Linda has... She's not tempted about all these worldly things. God's already seen that she's totally blessed. And the same with you. You don't need to be concerned about what's going around you. You just be concerned with your relationship with God and watch God enrich you in every way. Folks, in this church, one of the greatest things, if you get a chance, read Isaiah 35. That was the prophecy God gave to me about this church before we even had it. And in that particular part of that prophecy was that we are a church that brings people to restoration. I'm going to ask you, since you've been coming, hasn't God been restoring many things with you? He certainly has. Putting things together, showing you answers to prayer, things coming together, that your family coming together. So this is a church of restoration. Why? Because Jesus is Lord of this church. Now it's not the church. Any church is a church of restoration where Jesus is Lord. And there are millions of those things. All over in basements and houses in, in China and Russia. Christians, revival breaking out. 
But in America, we're wearing face divers and hanging out at the house. So it's time we rise up, church. Not be foolish, not be antagonistic. And listen, one more thing of wisdom I'm going to tell you. You guys are on YouTube. And you have these social things. Whenever you see one thing come up and say, show your approval for this guy. Show your approval. Don't hit any of them. Because they're monitoring your life. So if you want somebody, and maybe your favorite president was uh, Joe something or other, or Frank something or other, or something like that, you know, and they're asking you, what do you think of Do you want them back? Don't be answering any of that. It's none of their darn business. And it's none of their business to ask you whether you got a shot or not. Do you hear me? This is America. We have choice. We're Christians. Do you understand me? And let me just bless those that did get shots and, and the wonderful things. But if God doesn't tell you to do it, why are you doing it? Right? I haven't got enough time left in my life to be fooling around like that. Hello? Might be just a time like that that you end up dying. Right in the middle of that. Don't fool around. It's not the time to do that. All right, let's move on. Do you see the three temptations to Jesus there? All right, so command these stones be made bread. Which one was that? Lust of the flesh. These kingdoms will be you. Just bow down and worship me. Which one was that? Lust of the eyes. And if you fall down, throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple, the pride of life. How many know that those three is what Satan uses on everybody? He hasn't anything new. So let's beat him at his game. Go with me to James chapter 1 and we'll finish. You guys are so wonderful. Thank you for, you know, spending the time to sit under the word and Really make the word important to you. Because the Lord says, here's who I look. I look to the one that trembles at my word and has a contrite spirit. Humble. Amen. Those are the ones that I really look to. Because those are the ones that have ears to hear and a heart to understand. And thank God he described you. <laughs> All right, James chapter 1. Please look at verse 12 to start off with. Every man is tempted, period. So past the tense. The word temptation means test, trial, temptation. Okay, everyone say test, trial, temptation. All the same word. But from who? Well, God doesn't tempt us because he knows everything about us. But he does prove us. What do you mean? He tells you, do my word and I'll prove to you it works. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Two, Satan doesn't know where you're at, so he always has to test you to see where you're at and where you're not. That's why he's the tempter. He comes to see where you're at. And if you brag a lot, he'll be at your doorstep camped out because he's homeless. He's got his own tent. Hello. <laughs> amen. Are you with me? Guys are wonderful, aren't you? Catch this now. James is the stepbrother. I, we're doing James on Wednesday nights. You get a chance to either tune into it. The book of James is full of godly wisdom. He's the step or half-brother of Jesus. And he was the one that last got converted because he thought Jesus was crazy. Devout Jew and my brother's gone nuts. He thinks, he, he thinks he's the uh, Messiah. Then James gets converted. And so this is what he imparts to us. Verse 13, James 1. Let no one say when he is tempted. Listen, everybody first says this anyway. I'm tempted, why is God tempting me? Let no one say that. Well, but... God tested people in the Old Testament all the time. But this is not the Old Testament. You have God in you now. They only had God they were chasing. And God was coming to the rescue all the time. But they were looking to a Messiah. They didn't have the Messiah like you and I in our heart. 
Amen. So, that no one said when you're being tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. What are we going to do with that scripture? God cannot be tempted with evil. Look at me. Everyone look up. God cannot, say God cannot be tempted with evil. Okay, let me ask you. God lives in you, doesn't he? So if you're walking from the God out like you're supposed to be, and if you don't know how, I'll teach you. Because my pastor taught me. It's easy to walk in the spirit. It's not hard at all. But the devil says, oh, yeah, it's really hard. And if you think that, then it will be. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you think it can't work, it won't work. If you think it's no good, it's no good. Happy is a man that does not condemn himself and that which he allows. God, you're doing it God's way and you're still stumbling around. Don't freak out. Just enjoy God. He's teaching you how to walk. He's teaching you how to talk. He's teaching you how to do it his way so you can make a mockery and an absolute laughing stock of the enemy. Meanwhile, he's trying to make a laughing stock out of us because we're God's children and that's the best way he can get to the Father because he can't get any other way there, right? Through his kids. I let no man say when I'm tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Now you know he dwells in you. But each man is tempted when he's drawn away. Drawn away. Folks, none of you plan on leaving God, do you? So it's not talking about you leaving God physically. It's talking about you being distracted over a period of time and you move from the spirit into your flesh. You're drawn into your flesh. So Satan has to go, hey, piggy, your kids don't love you, haven't called you in a while, baby, 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 and she starts to think about all that. Next thing you know, things begin to move, and she starts to slide right over into that realm where Satan continues. But she says, no, I recognize this. I can hear my words speaking negative thoughts, and I saw Satan, I know that's you. See, Satan doesn't use his voice. Hey, you're never going to amount to anything. No, he uses your voice in your head. How do you know the difference? What did your voice is saying are right things or wrong things? James, too. Every perfect, every good gift is from God. So if you have thoughts in your voice language, in your thinking, saying you're just a bunch of, an idiot... Look at the stupid stuff you're doing, and you hear that in your head. It is not you. It's the, that's what happened to Adam and Eve when their mind was open, when their eyes were open. Now we get to filter what goes through our head. Can you say amen? And eventually, you just pay it no mind because everybody has the same problem, just a little different. So if we do, let's share the cure. You know how to stop the devil from speaking in your mind? Just speak out loud and say your name. Or praise the Lord. Your brain stops and immediately hears what your mouth's saying. So the next time you get to worrying and you're sitting up and rolling around at night, just say praise the Lord. And all that just stops. And then say it again. Praise the Lord. Now you're putting a little salt on the slug. Now you're beating him at his own battle. Hello. If the devil knows you're going to zap him every time he comes near you. And it doesn't fail. You just zap him and gig him with a little, you know, cattle prod. Zap! Bop! Here's the word. Bam! He's going to back off a bit and regroup. It says in the temptation to Jesus that Jesus left him looking for a more opportune time. All right. So James, it says... Don't say you're tempted by God. God's in you, so he can't be tempted by evil. But every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lusts. See the word lust? That is a fleshly desire. It can't be gratified. Lust is a fleshly desire that never can be gratified. One beer is not enough. Now you're drinking a whole case and you're on your lips. 
You see, you can't stop. That's lack of self-control. So you don't feed the beast. Say amen. So it says, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away of his own desires and enticed. Then one desire has conceived. See the word conception? You're adults. You know what it takes to conceive a child. You've got to play with sin for a while. You've got to lay around with it. You're going to hang around the world. You're going to end up acting just like them. You need to read Psalms 1. Blessed is he that standeth not in the way of the sinner. That means stand in the way of them getting saved by being a bad example of a Christian. Say, oh me. Thank God I'm not talking to any of you. Amen. So he goes on and further says this. Do not be deceived, my brethren. Every good gift, say good gift. Every perfect gift. First lesson I learned from my pastor. He sat us all down and he said, know the difference between good and perfect and the other. Everything God does is good and perfect. Emulate it. Everything else is not so good, not so perfect. The other one's involved in some way or shape or form. So discern him. Amen. Say, I got it. All right. So God does not change, right? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So you got the, the rule book on how to measure your thoughts, people's suggestions to you, the world's suggestions to you, the media. Hello? You can discern what is being spoken by lining it up with the nature of Christ and recognizing who is facilitating that narrative. You have a biblical narrative in two fashions, Old Testament and New. Perfect in all its ways. And then you have a bunch of cruddy narrative out there. I would just recommend you do what everybody else does when dealing with the devil. Hang up. Just say no. Just hang up on them. Say to well, you know, you did this when you were younger, and you did that, and everybody knows your background, and you mean you, you just hang up. You say, well, praise the Lord. As soon as you do, you smack them. Everybody, let's try this. And those of you on camera, let's just say from our heart, praise the Lord. Praise Put some effort in it. Praise the Lord. Praise now look at somebody else says, praise the Lord. And just do it one more time. Praise the Lord. Now, what's happening to your spirit? It's moving. Smith Wigglesworth, my last point, was always asked, how come wherever you go, it seems that the spirit of God is moving? He says, it's not so. He says, most places I go are dead. The houses are dead. People are arguing with themselves. So if I don't feel the spirit moving, I move the spirit. I move the spirit. How? By speaking the word. By praising the Lord. Those of you that can speak in tongues. Hello. You have a language given to you when you were born as a human. Later on was re-sparked alive when you got born again. And whether or not you want to speak in that language or not, it's up to you. But if you can and you have that ability, do. Do. It just irritates the snot out of the devil. Because you're talking languages he has no clue. You're hitting everything and you're bashing it all down. And you could cover in 15 minutes normally in English would cover, take an hour or two. That's why tongues are so important. Because a verb, a sound, an utter, whether you know it or not, all has meaning because it's infused by God. So yesterday... There was a situation about somebody was really heavy on my heart. And I said, Lord, I prayed every prayer that I could pray in English, thinking according to your scripture and covenant. So, Lord, now I want you on this issue to use my tongues as I pray in faith to cover that entire area and let me know when it's been covered. And here's what happens to me. Here I'm praying. Now, I realize I'm on camera and a lot of people don't understand this, but some do. I'm praying in the spirit. And I'm praying. And it's coming out of my spirit. My head doesn't have an understanding, thank God, because it will shut it down. 
So I just put my head on neutral, and I just speak, and I listen because God says it's done. He'll tell you, you got it. Boom. And you just stop and start thanking him. But see, what happens is we've been given these beautiful tools, but nobody's teaching Christians how to use them. And that's what we're about here. We're about teaching you how to be the best you you can be in for God. If you got a gift, let's put you in that gift and let's start promoting and getting you ready to be ministering. This is a church that's all about you having your place in God, doing what God wants you to do. It's not about Linda or me. We're not here to build some big building. We have all these programs. No, we're here to see that you become a child and a champion. And you'll notice by your observation, that's exactly what goes on here. Well, if you got something out of that this morning, will you give the Lord a praise? <laughs>